Good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle DeMarzo. I'm the Fairfield University Art Museum Curator of Education and Academic Engagement. And welcome to another one of our Art in Focus sessions in which we take a little time to look at just one work of art from our collection and our works on loan to the museum and have a bit of a conversation in as normal a way as we can manage through this uh, digital apparatus. So if you have any questions as I'm going through, please feel free to put them into the chat and our tech will send them through to me and I will happily address any of them that I can at the end. Though I'm never too shy to say that I don't know the answer to something. So our art and focus object of the day is this plaster cast of the statue of Augustus as Pontifex Maximus, which has been generously on loan to our museum from the Metropolitan Museum of Art now for quite a long time, from since 1991. And since we are keeping it Latin today, I do have to offer a small mea culpa to anyone who might have seen this event advertised um, a little bit earlier on. You might have seen it advertised for this sculpture, which is entirely my own fault. I was the one typing in um, the description of what we were going to do, happily looking at a illustration of our plaster cast of Augustus as Pontifex Maximus, and thinking instead of Augustus as Prima Porta, which is a statue, um, a statue that's in the Vatican Museums in Rome, its original form. It happens to be perhaps my favorite sculpture from ancient Rome. It's been my favorite since the first time that I saw it in a class on Roman art right here at Fairfield University with Dr. Maurice Rose. But it is not, in fact, a sculpture of which we have a cast at Fairfield University. Or rather, I should say, not yet. So if you or someone you know has a museum quality cast of this ancient Roman work, please reach out to the museum and we will happily put you in touch with the curator of our plaster cast collection. More on that in a few minutes. But instead of Augustus of Prima Porta, it's sort of twin in Rome or its counterpart in Rome is this sculpture, which is in um, the museum Palazzo Massimo alle Terme, very near to the Rome's Termini train station, if you're familiar with the city. So this is the original marble sculpture of Augustus as Pontifex Maximus created sometime after 12 BCE. We don't know anything more specific about the date of its creation. The statue in Rome is marble and the version at Fairfield University is a plaster cast created from that marble sculpture. Uh, even though it was a mistake for me to have accidentally uh, started advertising this talk as Augustus of Prima Porta, they are sort of two halves of a whole. Um, if you're not familiar with who the man is depicted in both of these sculptures, we're talking about uh, the man who was born as Octavian, who was the great nephew of Julius Caesar in ancient Rome, who was adopted by him, became his heir, and eventually rose to take on the title of Augustus and to be considered the first Roman emperor. So he has an extraordinary career spanning his reign, spanning about 40 years, dying in 14 CE. Um, and this probably was created about the midpoint. Uh, the original sculpture would have been created around the midpoint of that fantastic career. But those two sculptures put together, Prima Porta on the one hand and the Pontifex Maximus on the other, illustrate why for the Western world, no one does political propaganda better than this guy. So the Prima Porta statue is all about Augustus as the military commander, the bringer of peace, as the divine individual who was granted divinity by the Roman Senate during his lifetime, as a supposed uh, descendant of the goddess Venus even. And then we have this much more quiet statue, Augustus as supreme bridge maker, which is what the term Pontifex Maximus means. It's an office that was held. It's the chief priest of the cult of ancient Rome. And we're talking about, of course, about a polytheistic religion, offerings made to many gods. And the highest ranking individual was given the title of Pontifex Maximus. Um, if you are familiar with the modern city of Rome, if you've been there, you might be thinking this title of Pontifex Maximus sounds very familiar. You might have seen it etched into buildings and churches Christian churches all around the city of Rome. And that's because the Christian religion adopted the very same term to refer to the Pope. So the supreme bridge maker in Christianity today and Catholicism is Pope Francis. And what I particularly love is that the shortened version of Pont Max, which is what you usually see on buildings in Rome, that's his Twitter handle. So if you wanna follow the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, you can follow him at Pont Max. 
But that title goes back to ancient Rome, and that's the guys that we see Augustus taking in this um, sculpture. So just looking at the sculpture itself, it's it's a lovely thing to look at. Um, I'll show some close-ups in just a moment, but it is one of the, um, I think one of the most elegant statues to come out of ancient Rome. And a little bit of that has to do with his face because of course there is some um, self-promotion of the eternally youthful and handsome Augustus that goes on in both of these statues. As a spoiler, he was not this young anymore when either of those statues was made. But for me, it's really, it's the robes, the drape and fall of his garments that make this so wonderfully elegant. And um, I couldn't even begin to imagine the layering and wrapping the dressing motions that would have to uh, be done by his attendants in order for him to put on um, these robes, which are wrapped not just around his body, but we can also see are wrapped over his head. And that's a sign of, of modesty and decorum as he enters into a, a religious space. But the fact that you know, the way it clings to his lower leg, so if you look at his lower, um, his right calf, how we can see very clearly the outline of his knee and of his shin leading down to his feet. It's just so wonderfully evocative of the body underneath what is an extremely voluminous amount of garments. So it's a testament to the skill of the unknown sculptor or sculptors who created the original marble monument. And it's one of the reasons that I like looking at this the most. Um, as I mentioned though, we don't have a Prima Porta at Fairfield. So I might have a different favorite among our plaster casts if we had a Prima Porta cast at the museum, but we do not. Um, before I show you some close-ups, actually, I'll point out a detail in this statue that's really only visible when we're getting the full length view. And full length, by the way, is life size. It's 88 inches high. So he's standing on a little plinth there at the bottom and he's wearing sandals. You might just be able to make out the sort of crisscrossing straps over the top of his foot. And that's quite distinct from, I'll go back two images. This, the Prima Porta statue I mentioned as encoded with these messages of not only his rule um, as an emperor, but also in his divinity. And one of the symbols of his divinity was the fact that he's depicted with no shoes on, he's barefoot. Instead, in both the original in Rome and in our plaster cast, this is Augustus, the chief priest. So he is wearing modestly his robe over his head as a sign of zeta decorum, and he also is wearing shoes. So he's not putting on any pretenses of divinity in this particular depiction. And when I said before that, you know, no one does propaganda better than this guy, um, if you think about some of the things that, you know, looking at art gives us, the thing that art history gives us, we tell this to our students all the time, it's a sense of visual literacy, of learning to look through these symbols and think about the different messages that can be encoded in a work of art that you can very easily take at its surface level. So without any knowledge of who this individual is, we could absolutely enjoy the way that those garments are sculpted, for example. We could enjoy the features of his face and how wonderfully the different planes of his cheek and the wrinkles around his mouth have been shaped by the sculptor so that the light falling on it from our gallery really brings this into relief and leaves his eyes in this sort of hooded fashion. We could do all of that, you know, without any idea of who the man depicted is. But when we think about this in the context of ancient Rome, in the context of um, a political monument as much as a religious one. It's interesting to think through how Augustus wanted himself to be represented in his statues. And in this particular iteration, it's all about his uh, religious role in continuing the polytheistic religion of Rome that relied on sort of a regular, um, a regular tribute paid to the gods not just in terms of libation of liquid sacrifice, but in terms of animal sacrifice. So unfortunately, although the original statue had lost its arms, so we see it here quite hollow um, in the arm on the right, and then sort of cleanly snapped through in the arm on our left, um, his arms would have been extended because we're seeing him in the act of preparing to make an offering. So Augustus, the supreme bridge maker, the chief priest of the Roman cult, is doing his part in this statue to keep the gods of ancient Rome pleased with the city, with the empire, to keep everything going. So it's just a sign of how he could 
very ably represent himself not only as the supremely capable political leader, the divine heir of the goddess Venus, and also at the same time, the humble um, purveyor of the rights that would continue to make Rome smiled upon by its gods. So for the Western world, no one does propaganda better than Augustus. Um, and the propaganda doesn't just stop with his visual imagery. Uh, you may know, um, you may recall something you had learned in a Western Civ class about Augustus that he boasted of having found Rome a city of brick and having left it a city of marble. And just to make sure that in case you didn't see his buildings or you didn't see his statues, he made sure that a textual description of all of his deeds and accomplishments was created and etched into, um, into, into marble and into stone all across the empire during his life. And this is a text that is known as the Res Gestae Divi Augusti, the Deeds of the Divine Augustus. And what I find interesting, and you can read it in its English translation um, very easily online, and it is extraordinarily granular, and it is extraordinarily, perhaps unintentionally humorous in the amount of effort that he is taking to expound on what a wonderful leader and ruler he has been. But there is a chapter, chapter nine, which specifically addresses him in the guise that we see him in, in the statue. Uh, so he writes, well, he does not write, but he causes to be written. By decree of the Senate, my name was included in the Salian hymn, and it was enacted by law that my person should be sacred in perpetuity, and that so long as I lived, I should hold the tribunician power. I declined to be made Pontifex Maximus in succession to a colleague still living, uh, and he says a little later, and several years later, I accepted that sacred office when he at last was dead. So when I say granular, he spells out, hey, there was someone already in the office of Pontifex Maximus when the Senate was sort of tripping over itself to offer him every honor and office they could. So he humbly refuses the offer until the person holding that office, which was for life, had died, and then he takes it. Um, so like I said, the, the, the level of the shaping of his reputation and image in both text and in the sculptures is really incredible. And if you, again, if you have never looked through the Res Gestae, I encourage you to, to take a peek online and look it up. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. I've mentioned before in our Art and Focus talks that I have been using the sort of digital interface that we've been forced into by the pandemic to cheat a little bit in Art and Focus. And I have featured a lot of artworks that are either maybe too small for us to look at easily in a group or are in some sort of awkward site in the museum where it'll be a little bit challenging to fit a dozen people on those stools to really have a conversation about. And I have to admit that Augustus as, as Pontifex Maximus is no different. So let me go back a couple of images or just to this image. So this is the statue, the plaster cast, as it was originally installed in the museum when it was still called the Bellarmine Museum of Art. As you probably know, in 2016, we changed our name to the Fairfield University Art Museum, and we have been fortunate enough over our 10-year history um, to have filled our small Bellarmine Hall galleries to bursting and beyond. Uh, we, are, we are eagerly looking forward to the next iteration of the museum space, I'll just say that. And that meant that unfortunately, some of the plaster casts, which once formed part of the permanent display in that museum space, have been shuffled around our campus. So if you don't know about our campus plaster cast collection, um, the curator is Dr. Catherine Schwab, and we have more than 100 historic plaster casts around the university. Uh, many of them are part of our permanent collection as part of generous gifts from private collectors from the Yale University Art Gallery, and a number of them like this one are part of a very generous loan from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. However, today in 2021, Augustus as Pontifex Maximus is not on view in the Bellarmine Hall galleries. So this is a photo taken a couple of years ago uh, with my uh, former colleague, Lauren Williams, standing next to the statue. So giving you a little bit of a sense of scale in one of the um, plaster cast storage galleries in a different building on campus. And just the variety of material that you see around the statue show you another view from the other side, gives you a sense of the great richness and wealth of our plaster cast collection, which we are really so wonderfully lucky to have on campus. And I'll say not everyone appreciates plaster casts. Um, I certainly do. I know Dr. Schwab does. Um, 
But if you think of a time prior to what we're doing right now, prior to Zoom, prior to 3D tours online through our website, prior to digital imagery, readily accessible photography, and even if we want to dial it back further, well, we're back in a time when international travel is nearly impossible. But a century or more ago, when the travel for many people to places like Rome or to Athens was incredibly difficult, except for those who were the wealthiest and the luckiest to be able to make those trips, plaster casts were one of the things that brought art from Greece, from Rome, from Paris, brought it to places like New York and Connecticut. Um, so it's a wonderful opportunity to travel virtually uh, in a certain sense. I mean, in this room alone, we're looking at ancient Greek sculpture. We're looking at um, plaster casts of sculpture from the Parthenon, of which we have an extraordinarily rich collection. We're looking at Roman sculpture, but you can also find um, Renaissance sculpture in this plaster cast room. The eagle-eyed among you might be able to identify a cast of one of the, a piece of the uh, Gates of Paradise in Florence from the 15th century, the beginning of the 15th century. Uh, we just have this wonderful plethora of plaster casts. And like I said, it's a way to travel and to see things in the flesh, as it were, in as close to the original form as you can without going to see the thing in person. And the ironic thing, if any of you have had a similar experience of traveling a far distance and really looking forward to seeing that famous work of art, that famous piece of statuary, uh, I remember distinctly the first time I went to Rome and I was so excited to see that Prima Porta sculpture. And there's a bronze replica on the forum, but the real one, the marble one, was it's itself a copy of a bronze original is in the Vatican museums. And I got in there and was so disappointed to see the sign that said, out for restoration. And I think it took me three trips to Rome to actually see the sculpture in situ in the Vatican. And the same is true for the Pontifex Maximus. It was out for restoration. It's out on loan. So pl plaster casts are uh, a wonderful way to experience these sculptures, sometimes in ways that you can't even do with the original. And what I mean by that is, um, I think if you were at Palazzo Massimo alle Terme in Rome, if you were standing as close to the Augustus as Pontifex Maximus as Lauren is in this picture, you would have set off the very irritating high-pitched uh, proximity alarms that they've set up around this sculpture and some of the others. I know because I've set them off a lot. Because of course, what do you wanna do? You wanna lean in, you wanna get a sense of the surface. You want to appreciate all the differences of texture that the sort of mimetic qualities of a plaster cast let you do. Of course, we would like to go to Rome and see the marble sculpture in person, but you can get close to this in a way that you are, would not be allowed to do with that sculpture um, if, of course, this were still on view in the Bellarmine Hall galleries, which I've already said, by cheating, I'm introducing you to a sculpture that is currently not on view to our public, but may well be again in the future. Uh, I think I mentioned a moment ago that our plaster cast has a collection has also been enriched by um, gifts from private collectors. So if you are someone who um, owns or knows someone who owns historic plaster casts uh, that would be interested in discussing donating them to Fairfield University, please reach out to the museum and we would be happy to put you in touch with Dr. Schwab, who is the curator of the collection to continue that conversation. But we feel so fortunate to have these objects on our campus to provide that link um, the do I dare make this pun, Pontifex Maximus, to make the bridge? Yes, yes, I dare. <laughs> I've made it, it's already out there. Um, so this is, and I also wanted to mention, actually, this is a question, um, speaking of Dr. Schwab, uh, not only is she curator of the Plaster Cast Collection, she has been involved in the cleaning and restoration over time of our historic plaster casts. And I asked her when I saw this photograph that she had sent me, I, I was asking her about the difference in color and patina between the two casts on the right, um, the Amazon and the athlete, which are um, plaster casts after Greek sculptures and the um, Augusta sculpture. And what she told me was they cleaned the statue in 1994. So it arrived to the museum to the, I'm sorry, the university. There was no museum in 91. It arrived in 91 and they cleaned it in 94 and they applied a sort of tan patina to the surface. And at that time, it was in imitation as closely as possible of the original sculpture in Rome, which has itself subsequently been cleaned. And now the two 
are no longer perfectly in accordance. Um, but she told me that it's a bit of a warmer tan color than it is appearing in these photos. So it's another good reminder that um, as wonderful as digital imagery may be, the evidence of our eyes is always the best. Seeing it in person is always the best. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to time my visits to Fairfield's campus to get over to the cast room to um, take these photos myself in person, but luckily Dr. Schwab was able to furnish me with these. But now I'm looking forward to it. I mean, so much of what we've all been thinking about as this, we hope this pandemic nears its end, is the ability to reunite with those we haven't seen in a long time. And obviously our first thought is our friends and our family and our loved ones, but for many of us who are art lovers, it's also thinking about the opportunity to get back to the museums, to see the artworks that we, we know so well, but we'd like to meet again in person. And certainly on my next visit to Rome, Palazzo Massimo alle Terme will be one of my stops, and I'll be looking forward to seeing the sculpture again in the flesh. And until then, I know I have his counterpart at Fairfield. Uh, with that, if anyone has any questions they'd like to put into the chat that I can help answer, I would be happy to do so. Um, and if not, I remind everyone that uh, you are more than welcome to send any questions or comments to museum at fairfield.edu and we will respond to the best of our ability uh, to any questions that you might have. And so there don't seem to be any questions right now. I will leave you to enjoy this slightly gray and rainy day. And thank you all for joining us for our Art in Focus. Have a good day, everyone.